The next passage that's going to be read today is from Matthew chapter 7, verses 7, 1 to 23. And Brian's asked me to mention that this passage contains a golden rule, but he hasn't given me any more details, so I'll leave. I'll have to listen very carefully. So this is on page 1505 in the Church Bibles. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a steak? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruits you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the ones who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. Did you spot the golden rule? Did you? Because I'm going to say that if you're under 30 or over 50, you might disagree about what the golden rule is in this chapter. For someone my age, we would see verse 12 as the golden rule. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. But if you're under 30, if you're at university, like some of our friends are here, then your peers will probably say, well, clearly it's verse 1. Judge not. (laughs) Do not judge, or you too will be judged. We'll come to the reason for that. This sermon from Jesus Uh, from Matthew chapter 5 into chapter 7, speaks of the hypocrisy of some Pharisees and scribes who had lost the spirit of the law and who were only left with the form, the letter of the law. And this doesn't give life, uh, it kills it. At chapter 5 and verse 20, and uh, please keep your Bibles open so you can flick back and be sure I'm not making this up. But chapter 5 verse 20, Jesus says... I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees 
and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. And from here on, he shows us what that righteousness looks like. He helps us to see what that righteousness looks like. In chapter 6, Jesus speaks about hypocrites, those who pretend to live a righteous life by what people see, but whose hearts are far away from God. And you'll see in chapter 7, verse 5, that word hypocrite is used again. And when we get to chapter 23, which will probably take quite some time, but when we eventually get to chapter 23, you will see there Jesus uses that word again and again to describe the scribes and the Pharisees. Through all this, we must take care of our own life as we hear what Jesus says to each one of us. Not just to hear this as Jesus speaking to someone else, but also to hear it as Jesus speaking to me, speaking to you individually. Uh, This passage we use today from Matthew chapter 7, it begins and it ends with judgment. Verse 1 and that last little section from verse 23... Uh, of verse 21, ends with judgment. We start with words to us about how we judge people and we end with a realisation that we will all will be judged by Jesus and that not everyone will be welcomed into the kingdom of heaven and that should make us uncomfortable. So the message is about life now decisions we make now, and life eternal. For what we do now impacts what will happen then. And as we come into this, let's pray and ask God to make things clear for us. Our loving Lord God, you've given to us your word and it is beautiful. And there are things here which are difficult for us. And so today, Lord, as we we spend this time together, make your word clear that we may know you and that we might see the narrow gate clearly. I pray in your name. Amen. Uh, Michael, if there's another slide, can you jump to that? Thank you. It makes makes those pictures a bit clearer. In chapter chapter 7, verses 1 to 6, we are guided to judge yourself before judging others. So Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 might be the best known statement of the Bible today. Not John 3.16, but Matthew chapter 7 verse 1. Beck's smiling over here, so I think she knows exactly why. It's a favourite of young people who know a little bit about Jesus. It's a favourite of atheists who don't want their lifestyles to be scrutinised or criticised. And it's a favourite of progressive Christianity, which... Who, which has abandoned the gospel anyway. So we need to read it carefully. We should not see this as the only statement from the Bible that tells us about making judgment. It's not. It's certainly not. Most of the Bible tells us to make careful judgments, to be discerning. And so even this chapter does that, to make judgments about false prophets, wolves in sheep's clothing and bad fruit. But we must judge ourselves first. And so Jesus uses this image of specks and logs in people's eyes, taking the log out of your own eye so that you can take the speck out of someone else's eye. Don't look at the speck in someone else's eye without recognising the log in your own. And it's a great image that Jesus uses here. You don't need it to be explained to understand it and to picture it in your mind. But the danger is that you can hold this verse in mind about others. That you can hear this verse and your mind goes immediately to someone else who should take the log out of their own eye rather than applying it to yourself. You can see things clearly in others, but you don't see them clearly in yourself. We can point out the sins in other people 
And sometimes we can see that sin clearly in other people because it's our sin too. But rather than confront the log in our eye, we will confront them about the speck in theirs. It's like telling someone how to clean their teeth properly when you've got a chunk of spinach stuck in your own that you can't see, but everybody else can. Are you in a position to help someone with their, with their sin? Or will they just be wondering why you can't see it in yourself like everybody else can so clearly? So take the log out of your own eye first. Examine yourself. Examine your heart and your life Examine your sin so that you can help someone else. See, judge not, or you will be judged, is good advice for us. It's good counsel for us. But with what follows, we are reminded that you judge yourself so that you can help other people, so that you can make proper judgments on other people. Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 does not stand on its own. And if someone wants to say to you when you are trying to help them with their life and to find a better way, doesn't the Bible say judge not? You can say to them, yes it does. But now tell me what it says next. And see how they go with that. And then you can lead them and help them as you take the log out of your own eye. You see, this isn't about judgment. It's about serving. It's not about condemning people. It's, in fact, about helping people. But you need first to judge and to help yourself before you can help others. And then in verse 6, we have this... One of these verses, one of these statements from Jesus that we read and it's both difficult to understand and grasp, and just seems out of place. So what does Jesus mean when he says, do not give dogs what is sacred, do not throw your pearls to pigs, if you do they may trample them under your feet and then turn and tear you to pieces. Well, what it does not mean is that we don't share the gospel with other people. When we were in Tasmania, and I was getting to know some of the guys in the Presbyterian Reformed churches there, I was astonished one day, utterly astonished, to learn that one of the guys from a free Reformed church had lost his ministry because he was preaching the gospel to all people, calling people to respond to the call of salvation. And his church didn't like that. That's not what you should do. You should not present pearls to swine. It, makes no, it made no sense to me then. It makes no sense to me now. You cannot use this verse to justify that attitude. But what we can do is learn that not everybody wants to be helped and when it's time to leave them, leave them. Some people are determined to stay where they are. And sometimes you need to leave the pigs and dogs to themselves. Now, a lot of us have got dogs. Don't think of pet dogs. And don't think of cute pigs. Because some pigs are really cute. Douglas O'Donnell uh, says this, which I think is a helpful picture for us. Dogs were disgusting. And pigs, well, pigs were pigs. And to a Jew, a pig was the epitome of uncleanness, both literally and spiritually. Unlike the pigs we might think of, like Wilbur in Charlotte's Web, or Babe, they were not kind, and they didn't talk. They were more like wild boars. These unkosher creatures were not only filthy, but also greedy and vicious. So when do you decide to leave people to God? Well, that will be very much up to you, but it should not be done lightly and it should not be done easily. And you can still be their friends. You can still be their workmates. 
You can still play football with them and you can still pray for them and keep praying for them. And so we come to verses five, or 7 to 12 of Matthew chapter 7 where we are urged to ask, to seek and to knock. And this little section concludes with another one of these verses of Jesus which almost seems out of place to treat others as you want to be treated. Or I'm going to say, treat others as God has treated you. What does God do for you? What does God do for you? Well, let me ask this question. Particularly to parents, but for everybody, do you give good gifts to children? You, who's, children, who's had a, already had a birthday this year? A few, a few have. Did you get good gifts for your birthday? Please nod. <laughs> that would be helpful. I'm, I'm going to assume you did. Who's having a birthday later this year? One or two hands going up. Uh, do you expect to get a good gift on your birthday or a horrible gift? I'm sure you're expecting a good gift. I'm sure you're, if you've asked for a fish, that you won't get a snake. And if you've asked for bread, that you won't get a stone. And so Jesus uses that example. And we all understand what Jesus is saying. And then he says, how much more then? If you, even though you are evil, which is an interesting phrase Jesus uses to his disciples and those gathered around, even if you are evil and you give good gifts to your children, then how much more? How much more? What a beautiful phrase. How much more will God do for you? And with that in mind, we have the confidence to ask, Seek and knock. And it's to ask and keep asking, to seek and keep seeking, to knock and keep knocking. This is the, the inference of the Greek words here, to ask and keep asking. Now, we once belonged to a church where people had been taught that you pray for something once and then you just keep thanking God for it until it comes. That's not what Jesus is calling, calling us to. I think that's now called manifesting, which is more pagan than Christian. Ask and keep asking. You're praying for someone? Ask and keep asking. Seek and keep seeking. Knock and keep knocking. And what does the Bible tell us to ask for? In James chapter 1 and verse 5, and some of you will know this verse, James writes this, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. Ask God, who gives generously to all without finding, fault, without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Ask for wisdom. And when it comes to relationships, and dare I say, even with relationships in a Christian community, there will be times when you need wisdom. So ask for it. So that's what God is doing for you. Giving you what you don't deserve, but giving good gifts and inviting you to come to him to ask. What are you doing for others? If we are to treat others as God has, has treated us, if you are to treat someone as God has treated you, then we come to what most of us understand to be the golden rule. So in everything... Do to others what you would have them do to you. Why? For this sums up the law and the prophets. See, those people who, most people who know this as the golden rule know a bit of it, but have separated it completely from God. But Jesus here ties it completely to God. So, therefore, because of what I've already said, treat other people this way, because this sums up the law and the prophets. And remember Jesus said, I've not come to do away with the law, but to fulfill it. Here he can do that through you.
how do we treat this with, how do we connect this with verse 1, judge not? Well, I would like to have someone to help me in my struggles, to help me with my struggles with sin and my struggles in life. I want someone to help me not to judge me harshly and unfairly, not knowing what's led me to where I am. That's what I want. And if I want someone to treat me like that, then I should treat others that way. When I see people and I make a judgment about them, and I still do that much more than I want to, I don't know what's led them to that life. I don't know what's led them to be like they are. And my judgment is harsh and unfair. Treat people the way I want to be treated. When I was a child, I remember saying to my mum, nobody ever sends me letters. You young people don't know what letters are. Your parents will have to explain that to you. And my mum said to me, well, if you want to get letters, you need to send letters to people. So do you want good things from others? Then do good things for others. Do you want respect from others? Then show respect to others, especially when they're not there. Especially when that person's not there and everybody else is bad-mouthing them. Can you show your respect for that person? I once uh, heard of some people bagging out a minister, dear, dear mentor of mine, um, and everybody getting stuck into him, until someone around that table said, actually, I've never seen someone to be more a model of Jesus Christ than that man. The conversation ended at that point. Peter tells us to live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. And so let's do that. Let's live such good lives, treating others as we would want them to treat us so that they may glorify God. But we are called to judge carefully. So we come to the sticky part of that judgment. So one of the things we need to ask about people is, are they on the narrow path with us? Are we walking the same path together? And this can be difficult and it be can confronting and can be really hard to work out if we are on the same path. You know, we might think differently about some things. Do they really matter or not? Maybe not, and maybe they do. And so Jesus calls us to calls us to get on the narrow path. And he calls everybody to get on the narrow path. Now the weird thing for me here is that I can point people to the narrow gate. I can walk someone to the narrow gate. I could even stand with them at the gate only to see them walk away saying, hey, I'm not too sure about this or I still can't see it. But Jesus tells us that this will happen. In verse 14, small is the, ga- was it? Small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it. So, let's come back to what Jesus said, ask, seek, and knock. Find this narrow gate. Ask and keep asking Jesus to guide you to that narrow gate. Keep seeking that gate as you read your Bible, and I urge you to read your Bible, uh, and as you come to church. Keep knocking on that door. And you might be wondering, will you be welcomed in? Well, some of you know the story from John Bunyan, Pilgrim's Progress. If you haven't read it, read it. It'll do you good. The Neil Morse Band, you've heard me mention Neil Morse before, uh, wrote a great epic, The Similitude of a Dream, double album, amazing. And one of the sections here is, Christian on his journey, but he's lost. And the guide says to him, 
You can turn. You're not too far. The king loves you with all his heart and every lie can be made true for I have seen the broken sky turn blue. And Christian responds, you think he would have me still after I left his will and did some things I knew were wrong? And the guide says to him, go to the wicket gate, the narrow gate. Go and don't hesitate. His will is the way. Don't be deceived again by the slight hand of men with feet made of clay. And so he goes and the burden falls off his back and he is welcomed in. Will you be welcomed in? Well, hear what Jesus says. In John chapter 6, verse 37, we have this beautiful statement from Jesus. All that the Father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me will never drive away. Hang on to that. Uh, You can knock on that door and say, Jesus, here is my invitation. You said, I will never drive away whoever comes to me. And then stay on the narrow path. Enter through the narrow gate. Who is the narrow gate? Sharif told the children, the gate's not a gate, it's a person. The gate is Jesus. And only Jesus. It's not a pilgrimage. It's not a hard list of things to do. It's not an exam. It's nothing you need to pass. It's Jesus. Come in the narrow gate. It is a highway to hell, but only a stairway to heaven. And then stay away from the blind guides, those wolves in sheep's clothing. Uh, Neil Morse again describes that part in Pilgrim's Progress where some people appear the wrong way. Then in my dream I saw two men appear. They didn't take the long way. Instead they jumped the wall. They stood in the way the journeyman was on, accused him and confused him about the glory road. They said, you can take it easy. This life is not so hard. Why don't you come join us in our merry band? There's a shortcut to salvation. Cruise down the boulevard where decadence and destiny go hand in hand. John Bunyan could write that in the 1600s. Any number of YouTube videos are pointing out false teachers today. And this problem is as old as Jeremiah. It's older than Jeremiah, but Jeremiah pointed out to us, we heard from it earlier, what God says. I've heard what the prophets say who prophesy lies in my name. They say, I had a dream. I had a dream. How long will this continue in the hearts of these lying prophets who prophesy the delusions of their own minds? How long will it last? Well, it's 2024 and it seems to still be going on. And Ezekiel says, because they lead my people astray, saying peace when there is no peace. And because when a flimsy wall is built, they cover it with whitewash, Therefore, tell those who cover it with whitewash that it is going to fall. But how can we tell the false one? How can we tell a true wall from something that's just been whitewashed? Well, simply this. Sheep do what sheep do. And if one of them starts howling at the moon, be suspicious. Bad fruit is a sign of a bad tree. If the tree looks good, but the fruit is bad, be suspicious. If the tree looks like a lemon tree and there are grapes falling off it, be very suspicious. And elders do what elders do. And if an elder starts to doubt the Scriptures as the Word of God, or becomes legalistic without grace, then be suspicious. Make your judgment and, if you need to, do what Jesus tells us to do with pigs and dogs and leave them to God. Now the last section of this passage is confronting, from verse 21. Jesus tells us that those who enter the kingdom of heaven 
are those who do the will of my Father in heaven. I think we would all agree with that. That makes perfect sense. And then he tells us that those who won't enter the kingdom will seem to be the ones who have done the will of his Father in heaven. They call him Lord, Lord. They've prophesied in his name. In his name they've cast out demons. And in his name they have done mighty works. But it seems they were false disciples. Hypocrites who looked like they belonged but didn't. And now they will be judged by the one who has no log in his eye to remove. And what is his judgment to them? We don't need to wait. Jesus tells us what his judgment will be. I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. And sadly, we can expect that to be the bigger crowd. But my question is, where are you? Where are you? If you count yourself to be a follower, a disciple of Jesus, then let your light shine brightly. Be careful in your judgment of others and be discerning of false Christianity, for it is worthless. If you want to be a Christian, if you think you're a Christian but you're struggling to understand it all, then I say to you, ask and keep asking, seek and keep seeking, knock and keep knocking, and we are here to help you on that path. If you know you are not yet a follower of Jesus, you, if you have not yet fully trusted in him and only him for your eternal salvation, I say to you, enter by the narrow gate. Jesus himself. Even now where you are, if you're here in the building, if you're home watching online, if you're watching this months or years after it's been preached, say to him, Jesus, open this gate to me that I may come in and know my sins washed away. But if you think it doesn't really matter, and if you are a wolf dressed as a sheep, then hear the words of Jesus and take them to your heart. I never knew you. Humble yourself and submit fully to Jesus. And leave your pride behind. And if you won't do that, and I have no one in mind particular when I say this, but if you won't do that, then please leave this church and let us walk together the narrow path. The golden rule? So, in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. This rule has no eternal aspect without Jesus. Let that eternity shine in you. Let the love of Jesus, the glorious love of Jesus, shine in you as you live for him and as you make your judgment. Let's pray. Our loving Lord God, as we hear these words of Jesus, as we apply them to our lives, um, I'm pretty confronted by them. I'm finding them confronting. But Lord, I want to live to your glory. And so I pray that you will help me. And when I get bogged, remind me to keep seeking, to keep asking, to keep knocking, and to stay on that narrow path. And Lord, I thank you for those who walk this path with me, those who walk this path with us. Help us and guide us and by your spirit unite us. I pray in the name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen.